fortunately, I come with, depending on how you look at the world, good news. Um, today, uh, we had elections on Tuesday in Virginia and New Jersey uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and it was an overwhelming uh, victory for Democrats. We were expecting to do fairly well, and uh, we did tremendously well. Um, so I, I, it, to the degree uh, this is good news to you, I think it was the beginning of the end of Donald Trump, um, uh, which, is, which is a good thing. Um, speaking of Donald Trump, uh, as Marjorie mentioned, a lot of the way we look Does that work now? There we go. A lot of the way we look at communicating in political campaigns changed uh, in 2016. And uh, when I was thinking about what to discuss with you all, I was going to bring some examples of some advertising we did. What I often find happens in Europe is that the rules around campaigning are so different, and they're, uh, obviously television advertising is a lot more important in the US. So I wanted to focus on some big takeaways that I've had and my colleagues have had coming out of this election. Um, but I'm more than happy to discuss uh, specifics, uh, tactical issues, uh, if you'd like. I think there are three things that are really important for anybody communicating in the political space to understand uh, right now. The first is that most elections right now are breaking down to a question of change versus the risk of that change. And usually. If, if, you know, in the case of the United States where we really have two parties, one party picks one end of that spectrum, and I'll talk more about that. Um, the second, uh, and I don't think this is pronounced in Europe as much right now, but it's become quite pronounced in the United States, is how the electorate is separating based on socioeconomic status, socioeconomic uh, 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 place in society, ed really education. Uh, and the third is that media consumption is changing, which I think everybody here can really uh, appreciate. So let me talk about the first one, this change versus risk. Um, in the United States for the last 10 years, since the 2006 election, every single campaign, with the exception of the Obama re-election in 2012, every single election has been a change election. So in, uh, in 2006, Democrats gained 31 seats uh, in the House of Representatives. We went on to gain 21 more in 2008. And then only two years later, we lost 63 seats. That was the worst losses we'd had uh, in about 70 years. So uh, and then uh, from uh, 2012, as I mentioned, was a little bit more neutral. We can talk about why that was. 2014 was a swing for the Republicans. 2016 was another swing for the Republicans. And we are on our way towards uh, another swing for Democrats. In the 2016 campaign, it really boiled down to an argument on Trump's side that we just needed fundamental change. And on our side, we were trying to argue that that was too great a risk for the country to take. Um, there were a number of other factors involved in the race that we can talk about. Um, but we actually saw the same thing just play out in our most recent elections, where Democrats were now arguing voters need to turn out to send a message to Trump that things need to change. And the Republicans were trying to make an argument that the kind of change that the Democrats were offering was too risky. I think it's important when you are, and I'll talk more about this, when you are running a campaign to understand which side of that argument you're on. If there's one takeaway I had from 2016 is that we sometimes didn't fully appreciate that this was a change election. No matter what we tried to do, no matter how much we tried to position ourselves on the, on, you know, for change, it was a change election and people were seeking to change our party uh, from power. Um, the other factor that feeds into this is if you are the establishment in a change dynamic, your base is uh, not as energized as the other side. And again, what we saw in 2016 was, for example, with the Democratic base in places like uh, Detroit and Milwaukee, 
to some extent in Philadelphia and, and uh, cities like this, turnout went down pretty significantly, particularly in the African American uh, community. This Tuesday, turnout was quite high with the Democratic base. And so again, when you are thinking about the, the terrain of your election and your contest, you have to build in, uh, depending on what side of this dynamic you're on, you have to build in uh, for those losses. Uh, so what do we do about this? The first is, in some of the conversations I've had in Europe in particular since the election, I think a lot of people think uh, about the dynamic as, uh, particularly with regards to Europe, that there is, a, there is an establishment and there is a populist camp and that, uh, that you, if, you're, if you believe in Europe, you're establishment and you just have to fight populism. And I think the way we need to start approaching this is that we need to be for the voters. And so if we understand where, where the voters are approaching the election, where our own base is and where the other side is, that we need to position ourselves in a position to be successful with what they want. Uh, and, not, and not think that we have to overtly defend an establishment way um, uh, in, a, in a language and a posture that is given. We can create that and we can sculpt a message that is responsive to where the voters' uh, minds are. And on that vein, I really encourage people to be doing research to better understand voters' opinions because this pendulum is swinging very quickly. And it's easy to run a campaign that made sense six months ago uh, but not uh, at the present. Um, I think it's also important for elected officials to ask themselves, not just why are they running, why should they be elected right now, but really who are they fighting for and what are they fighting against? Um, because I think a, a challenge that we had on our campaign last year is as much as we talked about who we were fighting for, people are much more apt to hear who you are fighting against right now. Because again, if people want change, they usually see the world in opposition to something. So I think that's something that every candidate uh, really needs to think through. Um, okay, the second piece I talked about was the uh, growing polarization uh, of the electorate. And I, I, I think this is much more pronounced in the United States right now, but just to give an example of this, among white voters in the United States, which is the most, uh, typically the most persuadable voters in our electorate, um, college educated white voters, this is according to a, a poll by the Pew Research Center, which I think is probably a little exaggerated, but is helpful for context. If you are college educated, you are uh, likely to identify as democratic by 14 points. If you are not college educated right now, you're likely to identify as Republican by 25 points. Huge divide that has opened up in the electorate that literally didn't exist probably four, definitely six years ago that we're dealing with. Um, what, what are the, what are the the consequences of this. What we found in 2016 and what we're seeing continue to happen is that as the electorate divides by essentially how much education people have, you have electorates with completely different views of the world and understandings of reality because they're getting their news from completely different sources. So if you're college educated, you're more likely to be reading the New York Times or the Washington Post or The Economist. And if you're, if you're not college educated, you're more likely to be getting your news through social media. And this is something we all understand, but it's important being aware of as a strategist, more educated people are receiving their news through sources that are curated by a set of editors, right? They're selecting information out. Um, they're probably uh, imposing certain context into the news. On social media, it's what your friends want to share, right? 
And so first of all, some of that news isn't actual news. It's not true. Um, and uh, there's a lot of context that's typically missing. And so it's important to, we were ta caught totally off guard by this on the campaign, that there seemed to be this alternate reality on the internet, and we didn't understand why it was suddenly salient when it hadn't been in the past. Uh, and that's what's going on. And then the last piece I'll just, I'll touch on uh, is, is this issue of uh, how people are receiving their information. In addition to the fact that we now have an electorate that is uh, experiencing different realities, experiencing different news. There's also just more news out there. And this isn't just a Donald Trump phenomenon. It's just that with the ability to share information so quickly, the ability of reporters not to just write their one story for the day, but to continue to provide commentary and updates throughout the day, it's very hard to drive a message. It's very hard. And that provides a critical strategic advantage if your message is changed. If your message is the way things are is bad and I'm going to do something different, that is much easier to communicate than the way things are right now is okay, but I understand it needs to be a little bit different. Let me explain how I'm going to make it better. And again, this is something that for people who are, who are receiving the headwind of change uh, that they need to strategize uh, around. Um, and the last thing I will just say, and this is a, a challenge that uh, I don't have the answer to yet, and we're certainly trying to work on. Um, as I said earlier, we were surprised on the campaign where there was a lot of fake and false information out uh, that we first saw on the internet, and then we started hearing from actual voters when we did our research. And th that had never happened before. It was typical that um, there'd be conspiracy theories on the internet, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't actually break through into the public consciousness. Um, but that, that was actually uh, starting to happen. And we didn't have a good way to listen to what was on social media to pick up on those things beforehand. I think anybody who's running a sustained campaign now has to have the capability to hear what's happening on social media before it, before it enters the bloodstream in uh, a significant way. And what makes this very hard, and this is also a change that's happened, is in the United States, I used to know what a voter was experiencing because I knew what television ads were on, I knew what people were advertising in the newspaper and on the radio. I don't know what someone is advertising in the digital space right now. So if you're the electorate, I don't know what you're hearing. And this is a really hard problem because if you don't know what the voters are experiencing, particularly if you are, if you are receiving that resistance, that desire for change, uh, you know, you're, you're, fighting, you're fighting blind, essentially. Um, and particularly now that uh, foreign meddling has become more of a problem for us in the United States, uh, this problem is, is even more urgent. Um, and so that's something that needs to get uh, figured out. So uh, just to summarize quickly uh, again, um, it's really important to understand nowadays, are you on the side of change or are you making the argument that the change being presented is too risky? Um, secondly, we are beginning to see, uh, you know, across uh, the US and Europe that the electorate is dividing along uh, educational lines that's much more pronounced in the United States. Um, and media consumption is becoming so much more diffuse. It's becoming very necessary for campaigns to build mechanisms to listen to what's going on in order to understand what voters are actually seeing and experiencing.